From Gimlet Media, this is The Nod. I'm Eric Eddings. And I am Brittany Luce. Y'all are in for a treat because on today's show, we're going to have a debate that is sure to give you more life. That's right. Brittany and I recently went to Toronto for the very first time to do a live show at the Hot Docs Podcast Festival. And let me tell you, after our visit, nothing was the same. Yes. That's because during our live show, Eric and I shared some views (laughs) on a very important issue with a couple of amazing Canadian guests. Culture writer Sarah Haji and Metro News columnist Vicky Machama. So sit back, relax. Take care. Listen to this episode and thank me later. We invited Vicky and Sarah on because, you know, we're like in the six. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I know y'all don't call it that. No but one just calls like, that. Bear with let us. me live. Don't, don't do it. Don't do it. You know what I'm let me do my shit. Don't burn your bridges on day one. I was going to say, <laughs> work. Well, I'm going to say, y'all already paid to be here, so <laughs> we're all trapped. Um, <laughs> But yeah, we wanted to bring them on here uh, as Toronto experts to, you know, just debate some some very important issues with us. This is a segment that we like to call Good for the Blacks. What we're going to do is engage in a robust discussion on a given topic. And then we're going to take an official vote. And today it's going to be an official Canadian vote with some official Canadian black people. Yes. Oh, my God. Yay. (laughs) Right. And we're going to decide whether or not the thing we're going to talk about is indeed good or bad for the blacks. Yes. So, um, y'all about to hate me so much what I'm about to say right now. Oh, no. Mm -hmm. Given that we are in Toronto... (laughs) A.K.A. the Six. (laughs) A.K.A. Champagne Poppy's hometown. (laughs) Gotta do it. Gotta do it. Y'all always gonna talk about Deborah Cox? (laughs) (laughs) Come on. (laughs) Tamia? Is that what y'all thought we were gonna talk about? You know, we like to discuss something a little bit closer to home. Specifically, Drake's use of um, different world music influences in his work. A sprinkling of dance hall. A smidgen of grime, a light bachata flavor. Mm. Basically, what we're trying to decide today is, is Drake's appropriation of other diasporic cultures, their music, is it good or bad for the Blacks that Drake's kind of sampling the African diaspora? So just to provide a little context, when Drake like first came out, when he like really kind of hit on the scene, mm-hmm. he sounded like... This. And I say the same thing every single time. I say you the fucking best. You the fucking best. You the fucking best. You the fucking best. You the best I ever had. Best I ever had. Best I ever had. Best I ever had. Still slaps. <laughs> Let's just be honest about that. Uh, but in more recent years, like Drake or World Drake, as I like to call him. New Drake. <laughs> like Drake of the diaspora, mm-hmm. if you will. He sounds a bit more like this. He has a little more flavor. Move for me when you're extra. Move for me with the pasta. I'm building up a house where they raise me. good, though. It's good. Me, I go crazy. Don't switch on me. I got big plans. We need to forward to the really? islands and get you golden on spray tan. I don't understand how we got here. I don't even know what he said. I don't know. I don't know what language Drake felt he was speaking in. So, so we usually break this down in pros and cons. And I think we're going to start with the pros. What could be good about this? Sarah, would you mind kicking us off? Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh. Um, so Canada's not very cool. <laughs> um, we're like the Rod and Todd Flanders of countries. <laughs> we're like, truly nothing cool comes out of Canada. So I think... Like, yes, it's mildly embarrassing, but a lot of people seem to like it, and I'll take that. I'll take that. <laughs> um, he lends us a legitimacy. <laughs> Sorry, I can't even say that without laughing. <laughs> but I feel like, I feel like it, like, he, it's people are like, whoa, Toronto, Canada. Like, right now, you were saying all these things about the six and whatever. No one knew that 
shit before. No one used to talk about us mm -hmm. at all. So I think it's a pro, like people, un people are where we exist and they're willing to be like, hey, maybe Canada can be cool. <laughs> so I'll take it. The thing I appreciate about Drake is he's only like maybe 25% cooler than I am, you know? That's like, true. it's like, yeah. it's, it's kind of, it, it's reasonably aspirational, you know? Like, yeah. like, maybe I can get there one day. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's not that far off. It's like if you organize your money well enough, you yeah. can attain Drakeness. But that's is, the appeal. Yeah. You're, everyone's like, I can maybe be like Drake. Because yeah. it's attainable. It's attainable. It's yeah. possible. <laughs> but back to World Drake, I think like the, the, the thing that I do appreciate about this kind of this switch is he is elevating some new voices like take Skepta for example there was not a big conversation around like Skepta and oh well, Grime was Grime was getting there it was like on its, it was on its rise but like Drake just went and put a whole ass interlude of Skepta music on his album OVO man so unruly South by ride out no Suzuki got the Austin powers of man's extra groovy Slap. Front row jacket tailor made, crackhead swag with a razor blade, red umbrella when I make it. That's so much better than Drake, though. Yeah, I know. Right? <laughs> That's like so much better than anything Drake can do. <laughs> he knew what he was I know. doing. Calm right? down. <laughs> Seriously though, these are people who you know, like more often than not, you would not have heard like them on a number one album in the country. And so I do think it is positive that he is like, you know, he's bringing like Skepta and I think it's like Giggs and mm -hmm. Giggs also. Like he's putting those people in a conversation that they might not have been in before. Specifically with Grime too. Yeah. Grime is like one of the biggest black cultural exports from the UK. Yeah. Well, still a lot of people internationally don't, necessarily know about it. So for Drake to feature two grime artists on his album, like that's, it's, kind of it's, no, it's not nothing. Yeah. yeah, I think it speaks to like a way that black Torontonians live and move that I don't know is necessarily replicable elsewhere. Like I don't know everybody's experience, but like it is not uncommon to be a black person in Canada and know, you know, people from at least 60 different places and to be able to speak to or understand their experiences, which means that it's much more accessible to you. I don't know if he does it fairly, but I think like it's not crazy to me that he's familiar with, you know, Afro Soka yeah. or African music that's coming out of the continent and that he's in there and participating in it. Similarly, like I think that makes it easier for him to access being in London and speaking to black people there. If you're Canadian, you tend to live a very eclectic style of blackness mm -hmm. that's not, it's not definable in other, in ways, you know, somebody will say like, I'm from the South. Like if you're a Canadian and you're black, you have a very eclectic patchwork and pastiche, uh, to use a word from my degree, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> you got to that degree. Uh, experience of, of, being, of being black. You just, you know a little bit of everything. You're not an expert, but you know enough. And I think he brings that to his music. That's yeah, good. that was, yeah, no, give it up. No, seriously. Look at that. I'm yeah. schooled because, like, that is not, that's not how America operates. It's <laughs> not how America operates. Yeah. My pro is, like, there is, like, a sense of glee in the way that Drake sort of explores the diaspora. Like, he's excited about anything having to do with black people. He really is. And he is. He's thrilled. Like, he, like you know, for better or worse, which we will get to the worst in a minute. <laughs> Um, for better or worse, Drake is somebody who's, like, excited about black people shit. Drake is a black man, but he's also definitely a mixed famous person. You know, his mother is white and his father is black. In the United States, again, I don't know if it's different here. I've seen y'all's commercials. We were just talking earlier about how y'all's commercials got, like, hella mixed families That's in them. amazing. Oh, yeah, like thing, right? Whereas the United States, like, they had that one Cheerios commercial. Like, it was like a year <laughs> and ago. And then Donald Trump, I was like, That's it. enough. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like... But yeah, no, so like, you know, in the United States, like being biracial, specifically like with a black-white mix, it can give you a sort of cultural fluidity. There are multiracial people in the public eye who choose to remain ambiguous on purpose, which is definitely their own choice, but it can sort of contribute to a conversation about multiracial identity that is kind of erasing blackness. Mm -hmm. But like Drake is like... He's, like, excited about the whole of black culture, like, yeah. not even just America. He's not just, like, hype about, like, you know, the fact that his father's from Memphis. Yeah. He's not just hype about, like, Houston, Atlanta, Vegas. Like, he's excited about South Africa. He's excited about Afrobeat. He's excited about grime. He's excited about dance hall. He's very much on Team Black. Yeah. And also, too, like, don't get it twisted, parts of the diaspora are super excited about Drake. Like, y'all remember when Hotline Bling came out? <laughs> 
How can it's hard to forget. forget. It's yeah. hard to forget. I think some people are trying to forget. It's hard to forget. <laughs> Look at this dancing. It's so joyous. It's, it's so just joyous. Like, it's so fun. He didn't have a bad day, no. like, for a month. <laughs> He looks, you know? he looks so cozy in his sweaters and he's just dancing and it, you know, it was just so nice. He's really getting it in this video. Andrea Gomp from Remez Cloth, the wonderful website, uh, she said that he was dancing like a drunk Dominican uncle at a quince <laughs> with a splash of Carlton tossed in. Yeah. God. But the thing is, though, is that, like, that's, like, lightweight shade. But within the hour of that video being posted to Apple Music, there were, like, dozens and dozens of, like, hashtag Dominican Drake memes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Dominican Twitter was going crazy that day <laughs> because they were like, is this, like, is this bachata? Like, what? <laughs> like, I think, I want to say, like, the headline might have been, like, Drake goes full platano. Like, <laughs> But, like, that was, like, you know, Drake was, like, you know what? Black folks are in the Dominican Republic, too. And I'm excited about y'all, and I'm going to let y'all know I'm here for you. And people, like, received it. So it's, like, Drake's opening his arms, and the diaspora is hugging back. <laughs> Can I talk about that moment in that video? Please talk okay, about this moment Okay, so I'm this watching video. this video, and I was, like, did this man just take a James Terrell exhibit, which is an exhibit that was at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and it's like a white dude who lives inside of a volcano, look it up, it's real, and he, <laughs> and he made it a hip-hop music video, and like you can agree or disagree about whether or not Hotline Bling is hip-hop, but I was like, I got to see the exhibit, because I watched Hotline Bling. <laughs> And I, I think that's why I'm like, I love that he picks up on different cultures because, yes, he picks up on lots of different black cultures, but he picks up on art, period. His insistence that he's not just a black artist, but he's an artist, period, and that his artistry has, uh, has no borders is, to me, just a pro. Mm -hmm. And he's talked about it before, about saying, like, at an award show, he was nominated in the rap category, and it was for Hotline Bling, and he said, Hotline Bling's not a rap song. Yeah. It's a pop song. But he's black. But because so. I'm black, yeah. I have to be a rap artist. Mm. There's no other way that those people understand me. And so he actually didn't go to that award show because he was like, that's nonsense. I'm not canceling money for that. Mm -hmm. I will always stand for that because like, you don't have to be held within the boundaries of blackness in order to be a black artist as long as you are an artist. So I actually think that is a good spot to maybe pivot a little bit. So when we're thinking about thinking about world Drake or like Drake being the Captain Planet of blackness, mm. um, what are the ways that this is actually like bad for us? Something, something. I'll be honest. Something doesn't always feel right about it. You know. Well, you know there are a lot of there's a lot of talk about how he may or not be exploiting people. <laughs> um, I mean, in Toronto, he's, he's not where these people are. He doesn't live amongst them. He takes from, you know, certain cultures and certain people. I know he, a lot of Somalis don't really like Drake that much because, you know, he took this stuff from whatever, this rapper, that rapper, but what are they seeing in the end of it? You know, it's kind of like, yeah, they have this very minor cosign where it's like, oh yeah, Drake did the same dance I did in that video, but that's where it ends, you know? So I, I do think there's definitely something a bit sinister there. It is a little weird. You're kind of like, what are these people getting back from what he's taking? Yeah, I mean, there's definitely a pattern with that, where he, like, Drake ends up being the person who gets primary credit for something that lots of, like, other people's ideas went into. Yeah, I mean, like, I mean, even just going back to a lot of the grime artists that he's taken from, like, these people have been doing this shit for years. Obviously, it didn't start with Drake, and it's great that he's, you know, putting them out there, but... At the same time, it's kind of like, they, they also didn't need him in a way. Like, Skepta's better than Drake. He's always been better than Drake. Um, he didn't like need... I said, calm down. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Vicky. But, you know, I mean, I just feel like there's like a buffet and he's like taking a bit of everything and then he sits down with his plate and... I don't know. It's just a little weird to me. He's got a big plate. Yeah. He's got a big plate. <laughs> yeah, I think... Yeah, I love Diplo, but I know that man's problematic. Yeah. I don't need... <laughs> a black Diplo. <laughs> there, I have a prop. Like I have a problem with Drake showing up to people's things, loving their music, being pro-black, using it to make a record or an album, taking that money, and then I don't know that I've ever seen any follow-up from Drake to be like, okay, let me sign that person, or let me make sure that when I co-sign, I follow through. I don't know that those people are seeing those returns. They're having to sort of catch up after Drake's come through. 
and then sort of spin that into something for themselves. And I don't think he's responsible for everybody's uplift, yeah, but exactly. I do think when he says, this is my cosign, that he means that. I don't know that he he gives back in the way that it has been given to him. Yeah. And I'll also say, like, even though the songs are good, like, the songs are good, I hate that so I love good. them so much. <laughs> They're often, like, actually somewhat diluted versions of, like, the music that they kind of pull from. Like, uh, one of his, like, biggest songs, One Dance, was produced by Wizkid. I need a one dance, got a Hennessy in my hand. One more time for I go, high up I was taking a hold on me. And if you go back and actually listen to Wizkid's music, it's better. Baby, come to the Be, be, be number one in a Miss City. Me steady rep, representing for me city, yo. African boy, me rep my team, yo. Me come clean like me coming on me video. <laughs> like, it's, it's a lot better. And like, don't get twisted. One dance still goes. Baby. Like, I'm not sick of it. <laughs> not sick of it at all. But I worry for the people who listen to this and they go, oh, I don't need to listen to WizKid because I can just go here. I don't need to actually go to the source. Like that, something about that kind of troubles me in a way that I don't know how to reckon with. Can we talk about how a lot of Drake's fans are young white dudes? Oh, yeah. Uh, see, I didn't know this because I don't know that many young white dudes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a 30 year old black woman inside. Like... <laughs> I mean, it's the same of a lot of rappers. Yeah, no, uh, but yeah. here, in terms of like consumption of the art and people wanting to follow through, there's no further research that they have to do. Someone's like, oh, well, Drake invented this particular use of dance hall music. A lot of young white dudes are just going to absorb that and be like, Drake invented that without ever knowing that there's a history and a background. And that's where I'm like, ah, I wish Drake did a little bit more. I think a little bit of that comes from like, Drake is also just not a very like, he seems like a, he's a very welcoming person. <laughs> you mm. know, like he seems like he wants everybody to come and just kick it with him. Mm-hmm. And yeah. Whereas for some other rappers, I, I, I've seen some white people talk about rap where they seem like they feel a little bad for like loving it so much. <laughs> But nobody feels bad for loving Drake. True, true. Oh, and that's like, true. yeah, they're like, like you're just not. I think it's kind of like they feel like they're allowed to like Drake. Yeah. Where it's kind of like, mm, I don't know, I'm kind of scared of Instables, but, <laughs> <laughs> like, but like, they're, they're kind of like Drake. He loves me. I love him too. And uh, yeah, I'm just gonna listen to his music and not feel bad about it. Yeah. All right, something that I that I keep wondering about as like an American, even one night I was like in you know like a rideshare and my boyfriend and I were talking about. We're talking about Drake's shitty patois. <laughs> there was a Torontonian who was in the car with us. She was like, yeah, but like, that's what Toronto was like. There are some differences from how it is in the States where, you know, a lot of us are first or second generation immigrants that come here. We're from all these different places and we end up living in the same spots. And we share a lot of our cultures with each other. And I feel like that's a very normal thing. It's not weird to me that a young guy like Drake at the point in which he was immersed with a variety of different black people but also different racialized communities would have been like yeah like we all just mix in and we all take parts of each other and we all converse in this way so it's not it's not weird to me that he would have been mixing patois with random bits of yeah. Arabic or Amharic or things that he heard from his friends or like mixing it in with Spanish because that's those are the guys he knew which is like It took a long time, and I don't mean to blast him for this, to get my brother to understand why his buddies who were not black but were racialized couldn't say the N-word because he was like, what? But they let me speak Arabic. Yeah. And I was like, well, that's just not how that works. But... (laughs) But, you know, like, that was that, that was a very common thing. And so for Drake, who was a very young man by the time he became famous, to feel like, yes, he always had access to these things, that, to me, feels definitely Canadian. So do you think that, like, now because he's, like, more famous, do you feel like he has, like, a greater responsibility to follow through because of sort of, like, where he's from and how he grew up? I think yes and no, because at the same time, I feel like because Drake is arguably the most famous Canadian right now, people kind of place this responsibility on him to fix all these problems and do all these things like, for example, Honest Ed's closed over there. It's like a Toronto... No, this is... It's funny, but at the same time, it's not because Honest Ed's is this Toronto institution. It was a really discount store. Like, you'll see the signs out there. Yeah, Yeah. and it closed and people were like, why didn't Drake do anything? (laughs) And you're like... like, Because he 
can't save Honest Ed's from the condo developers. Like, what do you want him to do? Do you want him to like buy Honest Ed's and be like, yes, Honest Ed's forever? Like, I just don't understand. Yeah. Like, so, it was one thing when he went into the liquor business, but if Drake went yeah. into discount retail, yeah, he's like, <laughs> yes, it's like. I just and I feel like everyone's just expecting him to do all this shit he can't do, and you're like, no, he can't. He can't save on his heads, and uh, I don't think. And I don't. And I honestly don't even know if he's like, is he really even smart enough to understand what he's doing? Like, I don't. I don't know. I don't know. It's a. Uh, I it's, mean, that's that, that's fair, because I think that speaks to, like, an unfairness that we don't talk about. Like, he was a young dude when he became famous off Degrassi and then off music. Like, he did not have the path of, like, spending time with lots of, like, young, liberal, artsy-type people and other people who went to these spaces where you have these conversations to talk about, like, what are the cultural boundaries? Yeah, like, I don't And, like, was... that's just not fair. Yeah. It's like anytime you stick a mic in front of a hockey player and you're like, tell me how you feel about Brexit, well, you're asking the wrong person the wrong <laughs> fucking question. <laughs> he doesn't know. Yeah. I think he's willing to talk about it, but stop yelling at him on Twitter and via the New York Times. I just, like, I he just doesn't know. Not, I don't think he doesn't. I don't think he knows. I don't think, like, I don't think he's a dumbass, but... Like, I also, I don't think it's really on his radar to be like, oh, I should be really responsible about these things I'm doing. Like, it just doesn't make sense to me. I don't know. Yeah. So I actually think this is a good spot to vote. All right, what's it going to be? Will World Drake win over the hearts and minds of our panel? Or will Drake's rainbow coalition of sound be deemed bad for the Blacks? The exciting conclusion after the break. This episode of The Nod is brought to you by Burrow. Burrow makes luxury couches for real life. And recently, Burrow sent me a couch. It came in four boxes, and I gotta say, it was pretty easy to assemble. I know, I mean, I have one. I, ha- I do, <laughs> I have too. a, yeah, I had one first. <laughs> okay, um, it's competition. With you, it always is. Burrow couches are modular, meaning you can customize the size of your couch to fit your lifestyle. And you can also customize things like color and armrests. Wait, so what does your couch look like? Like, what did you get? So I got three-seater. And then I wanted something kind of bright. So I got the gray, the uh-huh. light gray. So basically what you're telling me is that you picked out a couch that is exactly like the one that I have. We have mostly the same couch. But you got the low arms. And I got the yeah. high arms. And I didn't consider... Now, mind you, I, the couch looks great. But I came over to your your apartment recently. Yeah, my domicile. And I happened to, like, lay my head down on the low arm it's side. Nice, right? And I realized... Damn, I wanted the low arms. Even when it comes to customizing a couch, I literally always win. You know what? Never mind. I love the high arms. Hurry and get your own unique burrow couch today. And to get $50 off your order, use promo code the nod at burrow.com. That's B-U-R-R-O-W.com. Offer code the nod. All right, so we have some uh we have some church fans here. <laughs> and um on one side, we have, if it's good for the blacks, you have a thumbs up and Michelle Obama. Mm-hmm. I know she's not your queen, but she's still our queen. She's yeah. still my queen. She's, she's, our, our, she's yeah. our global queen. Yeah. Okay, Let's go with great. It. And if it's bad for the blacks, we have Amarosa. Okay? All right. Okay. Y'all so, is there like an in between? I don't know. There's like a. No, sorry. You got to yeah, choose. Yeah, no, sorry. <laughs> you got to choose. Okay. Them's yeah. the rules. Yeah, those are the rules. All right. All right. So. Yeah. We're going to go down the line and you can give like, you know, like a few sentences about why you feel ultimately you voted either way. Yes. Basically, we're asking is Drake's appropriation of other diasporic cultures music good or bad for the blacks? Eric, actually. Oh, I'm sorry. I know you're always chomping at the bit (laughs) to share your opinion. Why don't you go first? Yes, please. So (laughs) I struggle with Drake. I really do. I really do, because, like, <laughs> the thing about Drake's music is I'll, I'll listen to it one time, and I'll be like, man, I'm not feeling this. And then I'll listen to it another time and be like, eh, it's getting a little better. Mm-hmm. It, just, it just gets you. And it really does. But it does bother me, because, like, I actually went and, like, I went and listened to Whiskey. I listened to some more Skepta. And, like, I'm like, damn, I really like this stuff. And I want to hear, I actually want to hear 
more of this rather than Drake's interpretation of that. That said, I would not have known who WizKid was if it was not for Drake. And I'm ashamed to say that. I am ashamed to say that. (laughs) But it is true. So I actually am going to say World Drake is good for the Blacks. (laughs) I'm sorry. Sarah, you look a little... You look a little sullen, girl. You okay. Here? <laughs> so I came into this conversation thinking that Drake was just kind of bad for the blacks. Um, mostly because, like, I don't really like him that much. I, I don't know if you guys got that impression, but <laughs> I'm, I mean, I never pursue Drake's music because I know I'll hear it a million times anyway when I go into an Old Navy. So <laughs> I'm just kind of like, what's the point? You know what I mean? Um, You guys did give a really good argument as to why he's good for the Blacks because, you know, he's not perfect, but he's a good ambassador and he's just so stoked on being Black and that Black people like him. So uh, I think, you know what? He's he's a sweet dude. Good for the Blacks. (laughs) All right. Uh... I, I think you just want to use Omarosa. <laughs> <laughs> I really like a lot of Drake's music. I go back and forth on views probably every other week. And there's a friend of mine who just gets messages where I'm like, yo, views is the shit. And then like they'll get the message the next week where I'm like, listen, not his best work. I have some notes. <laughs> <laughs> but what I love about Drake is that he makes it more interesting and more complicated to be a black person globally and for black Canadians that's a space in a room I felt I've always needed where it's hard to explain yourself outside of this sort of like hyphenated way like I don't know when people are being polite they're like African Canadian and I'm like ah if we're gonna get that detailed I'm from the hills of KC and I have a Canadian (laughs) citizenship but the way Drake expresses it or the way he takes and grabs from thing I'm like I understand Ghanaian people in a way that I don't understand the Kenyans who are proximate to me in Kenya. He makes the diaspora accessible and he makes it fun. And like, it's so fun. If you're in a room of black people who are from everywhere, it's so fun. And so like Drake does that for, for us and for me. And the fact that he demands and insists on existing outside of the boundaries of how other people think about being black, that all works for me. If he wants to be good at it and if he's going to get good at it and if he wants to explore that culture, he's going to do it. And I, I really love that sort of like diasporicness, but also the notion that we are limitless. And so, I mean, obviously, like, uh, good for the blacks. <laughs> All right, Brittany, bring us home. Okay, so if I'm being honest, I mainly first got into Drake as Aubrey Graham. <laughs> Jimmy? Jimmy? On Jimmy? the known Canadian masterpiece. <laughs> Degrassi, the next generation. Yes. Give it up. And I remember there was this special that they played on Noggin. Noggin is like, was like an offshoot Nickelodeon that we had in the United States. That's how we watched Degrassi. What up? <laughs> there was this special where they went to Drake's mom's house when he I was living. That. When he I was living that. There. I love when he's like, oh, I got my mama's basement. His mother's basement was finished. <laughs> Drake had a mini fridge. He was driving an Acura. He was 16. You should be in your mom's basement. Like, I don't know where else you think you should be at. But I remember he had this letter that a fan had written him that he saved that was like, you are going to complete the trifecta of black actors. (laughs) Number one, Cindy Poitier. (laughs) Number two, Denzel Washington. (laughs) And he like took that shit so to heart. (laughs) And I was his, I was like 15. I was like, ooh, no. <laughs> I was like, life is gonna be cruel to you. <laughs> 
And then he came out with a song with Trey Songs. What was it called? Replacement Girl or something like that? Yeah. Yeah, Replacement Girl. 2007 Trey Songs. I remember like I remember like when he first came out and I was like kind of embarrassed because he was just so fucking corny. Yes. And there's something about his corniness that like endeared me, but it also like irritated the shit out of me. But as his career has progressed, just his sheer excitement about being alive and like <laughs> making it beyond Degrassi, honestly, because I think like he, the same kid in his mom's basement who really thought that he was coming up after Denzel Washington <laughs> is like the same kid who's like, you know, I think it'd be really cool is if I had this like James Terrell thing in the video and if I was wearing like some comfy ass jeans and a sweater. The fact that he continues to like really try to chip away at like his own idea of what it means to be black. Like the fact that he's like still this like corny kid who like really, really, really just wants to be like liked and accepted by us. Like that makes me feel good. It makes me feel good. And maybe it's because I can't shake this idea of like the fact that he saved this letter, like this handwritten letter. Mm. Where he really, really thought that, like, he thought he was going to be Halle Berry up there think, crying with Oscar. Do you think he Oscar. still owns it? Think he still he has does. It? He knows Drake's song. He definitely You know, does. it's <laughs> it's framed up there with his first, like, little paycheck that he got from Degrassi. The pay stuff. I know that those things have to be together. But I think now more than ever, we need people who are going to be on Team Black. And Drake is on Team Black. And he just wants, like, the way that he's sort of, like, exploring what it means to be Black in different contexts, I think that a lot of us are doing that in our own lives and, like, sort of bumping our heads up against, like, boundaries and, like, sometimes overstepping and having to get corrected. Whether or not Drake is open to being corrected, like, remains to be seen. But overall, honestly, like... I fucking love Drake and I, I and like I really didn't think I really didn't think that like I was actually gonna end up saying that this was good for the blacks, but here it is. I love him. Good for the blacks. So with a unanimous unanimous vote. Drake, I did not think that this was gonna happen. I really didn't think I, I was didn't gonna either. I thought I was gonna omarosa it. Yeah. Turns out Drake's uh, Drake sampling. Good for the blacks. Yes. This is one of the nicest letters I've ever received from anybody. He feels that I could complete the uh, trifecta of the greatest African-American actors of all time, who are Sidney Poitier, Denzel Washington. And he says the third edition would be Aubrey Graham. I, I, will, I will keep this with me for the rest of my life. Thank you so much to Sarah Haji and Vicky Mochama for being such amazing guests on our first international show. We're going to link to both of their work in our show notes. And if you want to hear more from Vicky, you should check out her podcast. It's called Safe Space, and you can find it wherever you listen to podcasts. Thank you also to Will DeNovi and everyone at the Hot Docs Podcast Festival for being incredible hosts and putting on such a great event. The Knot is produced by me, Brittany Luce, with Eric Eddings, Kate Parkinson Morgan, James T. Green, and Emmanuel Barry. Our senior producer is Sarah Abdurrahman. We are edited by Annie Rose Strasser. Engineering from Cedric Wilson. Our theme music is by Khalid B. Additional music in the show by Talkstar. Next week on The Nine, we learn about a new game that asks you to outblack your opponent. She should win this round with Nelson Mandela, Little Kim, and Michelle Obama. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying she should win. I'm just saying that you guys should think about it. Thanks to our sponsor, Burrow. Burrow makes luxury couches for real life. Hurry and get your own unique Burrow couch today. And to get $50 off your order, use promo code THENOD at Burrow.com. That's B-U-R-R-O-W dot com. Offer code THENOD.